Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Romans, pastor of Faith Fellowship Church. I want to thank you today for tuning in our uh, service. Welcome you here. You ever wonder what worship looks like to God? As we join in together and come into God's house and we worship Him, we sing songs, we affirm great uh, truths, we listen to the Word of God preached, we pray together, we respond. I'm afraid way too often we just think about what we give on the outside. We hope all that God sees is the outside. But yet we're going to look today in Isaiah how the Bible says that God is a God who looks at the heart. God sees our heart. Today I hope as you hear the Word of God, that as the Spirit speaks to you, that you'll respond in a way that God would have you respond in a way that's right and pleasing to Him. Again, thanks for tuning in today. We pray that you're blessed. We'd love to invite you to come be with us anytime you're in the area. Our service begins at 10 o'clock. You'd be welcome and you'd be wanted. Thanks again. I hope you have a blessed day. Amen. Amen. Church, take your Bible, if you would, and open it with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the first chapter. Last week, we preached in Isaiah chapter 6, and my study time, I been drawn to the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at uh, some passages in the book of Isaiah. We're not going to preach verse by verse through every chapter, but we want to um, look at some of those passages of Isaiah that speak to our hearts so directly as individuals and as a covenant people. When you find it, if you would, stand with me. We're going to read verse 18 off the monitor together. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Read it aloud with me. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Father, we acknowledge today that you are the God who sees the inward heart. You're not deceived or confused by the outward. But you look upon and you try the motives and intents of the very thoughts and hearts. Father, today as we hear your word, it's my prayer that, Father, we would hear, we would receive, and we would respond to any and all that you say to us individually and collectively as your people. We desperately need the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit to understand and apply to our lives truth that we might be set free, that we might be transformed, that we might be built up and strengthened, and yes, Lord, even that some might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated. Isaiah is the single most quoted prophet in all of the New Testament. As far as that goes, he's second only to the book of Psalms to be the most quoted Old Testament letter, period. I think Psalms is quoted some 55 times, Isaiah some 44, 45 times. Isaiah prophesied over 40 different prophecies about Jesus specifically. We're not going to look at all of those, but some of them include, of course, Jesus' birth. The virgin shall conceive and give birth. He prophesied about the ministry of John the Baptist. He prophesied about Christ's anointing with the Holy Spirit. He prophesied how the nation Israel would reject their Messiah. He's the first to refer to Christ as the stumbling stone that the builders would reject. He prophesies about Christ's ministry to the Gentiles. He prophesies about the Savior's suffering, about His death, about His resurrection, about His return, and about His millennial kingdom, and so much more. But in all of these things, Isaiah talks about, and God uses Isaiah to speak the principles of His day, 
that are also principles that remain for covenant people throughout. We're not going to take a lot of time to look at when he speaks to Edom or to Babylon or to Moab and those kind of things. Those are very relevant for his day. But there's times when God uses Isaiah to speak to a Israel, a covenant people. They were a covenant. They had a blood covenant. They brought the sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats. And we see principles about how God deals with and how God responds to an individual and also a covenant people together. Last couple of Sundays, we've talked about seeing God. In chapter 6, Isaiah sees God on his throne, high and lifted up. But this morning in chapter 1, Isaiah's prophecy begins in verse 1 with a vision of God. And Isaiah says to a covenant people, this is what God sees. This is what God sees. You ever thought about that? Since hours ago on the other side of the globe and these last few hours as the sun has come up on the east coast and now it's moved into the central time zone and it's moving on westward, people are gathering in places like this. They're gathering together. They're worshiping and however they're led to do so. Different languages, different songs, different motivations. You ever wonder what that looks like to God as he observes from heaven when people gather and call it worship? What God sees. One of the great lies that's plagued God's people for centuries is that if I bring it to God, he's compelled to receive it. If I bring it to God, God's got to take it. He's got to give me credit. That was so prevalent in the nation of Israel in Malachi, the last prophecy of the Old Testament. God says, try that with your government. Take half of what the government says you owe down and see if they'll be glad to take it. They'll take it, then they'll take you to jail. He said, I'm a holy God. You bring, you're supposed to bring the best you've got. And you bring the, the lame, the sick, and the, and, the, and the mauled to me. And you say, now God, here it is. God said, I wish somebody would have had enough fortitude to lock the doors on the temple. Because not only do I not receive it, I hate it. Because what it says about me to you angers me. Isaiah begins his letter, this prophecy. If you notice in verse 1, a vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he spoke concerning Judah and Jerusalem. We're down now. The tribes, the, the 12 tribes have separated. There's the 10 northern tribes. That's called Israel. The two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin are referred to as, as Judah. Jerusalem is that capital where God has established himself to be worshiped. And so Isaiah is a prophet to the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. The northern kingdom went away in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom made it on down another 100 years to 605 B.C. So Isaiah is prophesying, we're told, through the kings of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. So with Hezekiah's death, Isaiah begins to see a people who are in that repetitive pattern over and over, it seems, with the covenant people of God of the Old Testament, how they were in bondage in Egypt and they cried out and God delivered them. They can't even get into the promised land. And they're rebelling in the wilderness over, don't like the water, ain't got enough water. We ain't got nothing to eat, oh God, we're sick of manna. God, get these quail off of us, we're about to vomit. In every turn, there are people who forget God. They forsake God over and over and over. Aren't you glad we don't do that? Sometimes you comfort the afflicted, and other times you afflict the comfortable. 
But Isaiah is seeing that pattern and he's seeing where the people are. The day in this first chapter as we think about how God sees us. I want to talk about a couple of things. The first one is in verses 2 through 10. Isaiah gives an indictment. In, chapters th- in verses 2 through 10 of chapter 1, Isaiah uses five pictures to portray, portray what God has committed to being to Israel, how God wants to be there for them, and how God wants to bless them, but how the people have responded to that picture and to that part of God's relationship to them. Notice verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He's first wanted to respond to them as a father. The prophecy talks about him dealing with them. We see it's a prophecy. Look in verse 1, the vision. Verse 2, the Lord has spoken. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 20, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is, Isaiah is saying, I want to share with you what God sees and what God says about what he sees. And he starts then with these pictures. The first one being a picture of a father. So I've raised up children. I've nourished you. I have been to you that godly parent. I, I have been the one that's been responsible for your life. That you're here because of my intervention and my work. But he said, you've rebelled against me. Number two, he says, I've wanted to be to you a Lord and a master. Look at what he says in verse three. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Listen, even an animal knows to respect its Lord and its master. Even an an animal can learn that. He said, where is the honor? Where is the respect? Do me as Lord. Well, I want you to know, I don't like that. If anybody being Lord of me, what that means is sin is already Lord over you. Everybody's Lord has a Lord. It's either self and sin or it's the Savior, one of the two. I said, I wanted to be Lord to you. I, I wanted to be master. I, I, I deserve that from you. But notice, he says, my people don't consider that at all. They don't even think about me in those kind of terms. How do you think of Jesus? You think about him as your buddy, buddy, pal, pal? Think of him as just your, your, your friend that understands and goes along with the, the sinful choices that are there and the, the flesh that's compelling you onward, that somehow he's just okay with all of that? We don't even think of him as Lord and Master at times, at times. Verse 4, a last sinful nation of people notice laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backward. God said, I led you, I was a leader to you. I was a leader to you, I led you out of Israel. I mean, out of Egypt, I I opened the doors for you of the Red Sea. You walked across on dry ground. I led you to the very door of the promised land. And when you rebelled and would not by faith go in, I led you every step of the way for 40 years in the wilderness with a fire by night and a cloud by day. I've been your leader. But what's happened? You've gone away backward. That third one there, Jonathan, is leader, a leader. Not to lead you astray, not to lead you out of places of blessing, but to lead you into those things. I can't hardly have this picture of a leader and not think about my limited experience with horses. How some horses, with just the touch of the rain on the side of their neck, will go. But others, you have to put a bit, a fierce bit in their tender mouth because they are strong-willed and they are strong-headed. 
and you've got to by force and by some limited amount of pain say to them, you will follow my will. I've always wanted to be tender-mouthed. I've always wanted to be, Lord, easily leadable. But I've not always been. There's times God's got to yank me around by the nap of the neck and by the bit of the mouth and say, why are you rebelling against my leadership? Why are you rebelling against me as your leader? Verse 5 and verse 6, he talks about another picture. Look, why should you be stricken? Will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faints from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. God said, I I was going to be to you a doctor, a physician. I I was going to be to you uh, the Jehovah Jireh, the God who heals. For 40 years in the wilderness, you wandered and you walked. You ate what I gave you. You drank what I gave you. And your ankles never swelled. Now, you may not have understand what that means. What he's saying is, ankle swelling is one of the first signs of rickets, of malnutrition. God said, what I fed you, what I gave you, I sustained you. You were healthy. I brought you out of Egypt, and I delivered you into the land, a wholesome, healthy people, spiritually and physically. But now God said, I look at you and I see putrefying sores. I see from the soles of the foot to the top of your heads, unsoundness. There's nobody there to apply the balm and the ointment because that's what I do. But he says, I look at you as a covenant people and there's no soundness. I've not been closed up or soothed. God looked at the nation Israel and he said, oh, I wanted to be so good to you. I wanted to be so good to you. I was so good to you. But you responded to that with rejection and rebellion and forgetting and not considering and walking away. The last picture, verse five, uh, picture five is that of a protector. Look at verse uh, seven through nine. The country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Notice how many times the word stranger is used. Strangers devour your land in your presence. It is a desolate and overthrown by strangers. So daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us as a small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. He says, listen, I, I was your protector. When I brought you into the land, I drove out your enemies with the bees with the hornets. I put them in disarray and they took their own swords and over 180,000 killed each other without you even walking into the fray. You shouted and blew trumpets and walls fell down. You took 300 around over 10,000 and you shouted, broke trumpets, broke broke your, your pictures and the light shone through and they turned and killed each other. I delivered you. I protected you. I did everything in the world. I was a hedge around you. And that didn't seem to matter. Even that didn't cause you to remember and obey. Now, maybe you're having a little bit of dissonance with this but Tony that's an Old Testament people that's an Old Testament people and you should have a little bit of dissonance at that point as Nancy and I were going through our reading we were listening in Judges reading through Judges and it was just wearisome it gets so old and the people forgot God and did what was evil in God's sight but more evil than the people before them And God sent Syria, God sent Moab, God sent Edom, one after the other. And he, for 30 years, for seven years, for 10 years, and finally they cried out and God sent a deliverer. And he said, okay, now they're going to get it right. And they had peace in the land 30 years. And then the people did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it just wears you out. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading the next night. I listen to this and we're reading this. I get to thinking, I'm so glad that 
we didn't come in this morning and there's a totem pole or there's an Astroth pole or there's an altar to Baal and we're not bowing down and we're singing no songs to Baal or to Satan. We're singing no, no worship songs to I, Isis or, or to God of the sun and the moon. We're not worshiping any of that. I feel good about that. Amen. But it was that other phrase I couldn't get away from. Two things about it. Number one, they forgot God. They just didn't consider him. There were times when they went through times where he never even entered their thoughts. I recognized that. Then a second thought that seemed to lay me open was, I have what they never had. I have an indwelling Holy Spirit who came in on the day he saved me and he indwells me to convict me of sin and to lead me into righteousness, to teach me the things of God, to encourage me and enable me to live those ways. They didn't have any of that. They had no indwelling Holy Spirit. They had a law around them. They had all the images to remind them. They had all the work of God to, to, to remember and to sustain them. But how much is it for us to grieve and quench and do despite to a spirit of grace. Writer of Hebrews says, oh, how much worse it is because we, unlike they, we splatter underfoot the blood of the Savior as we make our way back to sinful things. God is saying is this. It's one thing to be my blood covenant people to be in a relationship with me out of grace and mercy and love. But that is a relationship that is not on some kind of autopilot. It's not a relationship of your name on a roll or your name even written in a Lamb's Book of Life, even though it indelibly is. The day-to-day -day walk is about a love for me and a life for me that is lived out, listen, from the heart. That's the second thing Isaiah begins to deal with as he shares what God sees. Number two, the insincerity of the people. In verses 10 through 5, listen with me about all of the outward things they're doing. But now, notice also, just make a note, he refers to Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 10. There's a reason for that. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He likens Israel to those people. Why? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lamb or of goats. When you come to appear before me, what is required this, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices, incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure the iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. You see, we always want to think of the outward observance. We, we always believe, uh, we, we're, we're hopeful, okay, God, 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 you see me, God, God, whoo, what's, what's the address of the church? 175 East. Lord, I'm in the right location. I'm here. See me, God? You see me lift my hands a while ago, Lord, when we sang, I lifted my hands. God, you hear me pray a while ago, we prayed, you see me praying, God? I pray. There's nothing wrong with those things. Those are wonderful things. But listen to me. God doesn't say he hates those things that Israel is doing because they're wrong things. He's saying you think that's all that matters. You think that that's just what this is all about. You think that these outward things are why I've entered into a covenant with you. And it's not. 
On one day they would be at the Astroth pole worshiping Baal, and the next day they'd be down at the temple with the lamb. It'd be like what we were doing last night on Saturday night, on Friday night, what we were doing last week, and then walk in on Sunday. See me, Lord. See me, God. God says, that's not the problem. The problem is I've been seeing you since last Sunday when you walked out. And I've been seeing every moment your heart. I saw your heart this morning when you sang. I saw your heart this morning when you prayed. I see your heart right now as you're preaching. I, hear, I see your heart as you're listening. He's a God of the heart. And he says, listen, when you do those things without your heart, it is at best patronage. It is worse. It is abomination. It's an insult. And I hate it. Who likes being patronized? Who likes being despised and treated sinfully? God said, you're not entering my gates, you're trampling my courts. You're saying your prayers, but I'm not hearing them. You're raising your hands in worship, but I don't see it. Why? Because I see your heart. I know your motives and I know your intents. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. He referred to Sodom and Gomorrah. It might surprise you to know that Sodom and Gomorrah were an extremely religious people. In Ezekiel 16, verse 49 and 50, listen to what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. This is the iniquity of Sodom, pride, fullness of food, an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and they committed abomination before me. Man, they were religious people. It was a religious people that nailed the hands of the Savior to the cross. It was an, it's an outwardly religious people that can do those kind of things. Commentator Leopold said that this is the most scathing indictment in all the Word of God. That a people will bring to God anything without their heart. Without their heart. Verse 15, he says, your hands are full of blood. That's watchman terminology. The watchman who sat upon the wall, he pervades the horizon for the enemy to come. He watches in the inside of the city like a watchman for the prowler who might already be within the gates. And when he sees enemy approaching, he cries out and he calls out. And when he does that, he relieves himself of responsibility of how they respond. If he calls out and he warns and the city comes to life and they respond, then great. He's done their job. If he cries out and they sleep and enemy comes, their blood is required but not of his hands. But if he does not cry out, if he does not speak, if he does not give warning and give heed, if he doesn't give the righteous call, Death and destruction will come, but this time there is blood, accountability on his hands. He says, you live among these heathen people, and instead of, instead of teaching them the ways of Yahweh God, you're bowing down to their poles. You're bowing down in their groves. You're bowing down at their places of worship. You're singing the songs they sing. You're saying the things they say. You're more like them. They are salt and light to you instead of you being salt and light to them. How is it that this many million people can live in America and America still be so desperately lost? Maybe it's because our Christianity is contained with the outward things that we do inside the walls of our church. And the blood that's on our hands seem to give us no pause, seem to give us no grief, 
no trouble. Because God ought to be happy. I put, a do- I put $10 in the offering plate. What's God's problem? I'm here today. What's God's problem? I sang today. What's God's problem? I prayed today. What's God's problem? Listen to me. It's not God's problem. It's the problem of our heart. God is a God of the heart. Notice the inward obedience, verse 16 and 17. God says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cleanse to do evil. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke oppressors. Defend the fatherless. Plead the widow. God is a God of the heart. He says there's got to be inward obedience. A cleansing that is inward first and foremost. Notice he says, wash yourselves. How do we do that? Well, there's a stop and a start. First of all, he says, stop doing your evil. Put away evil, your evil doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Stop it. That's why the the, the New Testament is full of passages like crucify the flesh. Put off the old man. Put on the new. Why? Because we've got to stop and then start. Notice he says next verse, learn, learn. Verse 17, learn to do good. He gives some specifics. Seek justice. That's righteousness. Rebuke the oppressor for that one who's being oppressed and can't speak for themselves. Always be righteous and speak for the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. James comes to these passages and he says, this is what true religion is like. Somebody has a heart and he cares for the fatherless, the orphan, and he cares for the widow who's in need. You see, the neediest among us are always the concern of the righteous. At the risk of political, I don't care. Can you think of a more needy among us than the unborn child in a mother's womb? Defend the oppressed. Rebuke the oppressor. Speak out. Seek justice and righteousness. The lost among us are oppressed by the greatest oppressor, Satan, and lostness. We're to speak righteousness and justice. We are to to defend for them by sharing with them the gospel that sets them free. Well, number three, and we're done. Roman number three, the invitation. Verse 18 through 20. Section begins with the verse we read out loud. God sees the real need of our lives. And more than seeing it, God addresses it. And you would think after that scathing indictment, maybe you'd hear God say, and by the way, I'm done with you bunch of dogs. I'm going to find another Abraham. I'm going to raise up another people because you're just, you've just tried me and I'm through with you. Listen to me. I know I felt that way before God. I felt like that's what God ought to say to me. He never has. He never has. Satan has tried to condemn me and say, oh, you're going to take that old sin back to God again, huh? Don't you think God's sick of hearing that? I know I'm sick of taking it. I know that. I want to crucify it. I want to throw it off, and I want to quit it so I don't have to bring it before him again. But I've never one time gone to God with a repeated sin and hear God say, what, again? I've never heard God say, are you kidding me? I've never heard God say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm through with you. What I've heard God say over and over and over is, come now, Tony. Let's reason together about this. I've got for you what you need. He talks, first of all, about the call. The call. He says, come now, let us reason together. If you read very many commentaries, even in your study Bible, you may have seen something about a courtroom at the beginning of this chapter because the word come now, let us reason together. It's let's, let's, print our, let's, let's present our evidence. It's, it's courtroom language. It's official legal language. 
God said, I want you to come. God said, I'm calling you. I want you to come before me, and let's present the evidence that we need to see this morning. And at first thought, that terrifies me because, God, the evidence against me is far greater, it seems, than the evidence that's for me. But that's not true. God says, come now, let us reason together. Notice the come now, there's urgency. Don't put this off. Don't keep delaying this. Living, living an outward life without the inward reality is something that gets stronger and more solid. It gets more, our heart gets more calloused. We get more, our conscience gets more seared to it. And we keep believing a lot. See there, I'm getting along. See there, I'm okay. God hadn't struck me dead yet. I'm still going. I, my whole life may be, a lot of my life may be in shambles, but I, my whole life is not devastated. And I'm getting over and I'm, I'm making it work. And all those lies seem to whisper, you're okay. Keep it up. You're okay. Everybody, everybody that looks at you thinks you're great. That is everybody except the one that matters. The one that matters who sees the heart and the intent and the motive of everything I am and everything I do. He says, come now, let us reason together. He says, listen, this is reasonable. Let's, let's, this is logical. Let's think this through. Let's, let's be judicious in this. Here's the evidence. You're a sinful man. Here's the evidence. You're a sinful people. Here's the other evidence. You can't take it off yourself. You can't rid yourself of the sin of your own life. You can't get rid of it by and of yourself. Can't do it. But what if I start doing better? But what about all the old sin? But what if I from this day on live different? But what about all the past sin before holy God? That stench hasn't gone. That stench hasn't left. So if you try to do better and you try and you reduce the number of sin, some amount, you're still not going to eliminate sin. We're still going to be adding to it. I had this thought. I didn't know if I was to share it or just be hurt by it. I got to thinking about my sin. And if every sin was just one brick, and I brought it in here this morning just from last Sunday, and I stacked them up in the place. The sin of omission as well as the sin of commission. The sin of fault. The sin of intent. The times when I forgot to remember and I failed to consider. If all of that came, would the slab to hold just my weight? If we brought your brick and added them to mine, surely the slab wasn't built for that and couldn't handle it. The room couldn't contain it. That is the evidence. That's irrefutable. That is what God sees. The call is to come and reason. But then the invitation is for cleansing. Look at verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's a little bit of imagery in there that we may just miss if we rush to too quick. Let me take a moment and hit it real quick. Sins are like scarlet, blood red. He's talking about those sins of blood. Those sins that we've committed outright. Though they be red like crimson, speaks of the dye of the beetle. That once it's put to the wool, it can never be quite again the sins of omission commission where Satan just discolors discolors the purity of our lives because we don't take serious what it means to be his people through the blood of his son notice what he says that which is intended to be indelible that which is intended to be unchangeable look at what he says he says though they be like scarlet, be white as snow. Now, white of snow is a pristine purity. It comes that way. 
It's in a moment it falls. And at the moment it falls, the whole earth is turned white. It's the most beautiful thing imaginable, is it not? To see that which was muddy and dirty and drab of winter all of a sudden covered in the beauty of a pristine whiteness that's instant as it comes. That instant positional cleansing of the Lord. He says, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That process, that progressive whitening. God says, that which is to be unchangeable, that which is to be indelible, I change and I affect and I impact. What you can't change, I can't. Come to me. Come to me. I will cleanse you. I will forgive your sin. I will, if you're from the heart, come to me. You've been coming, he's saying to Israel, you've been coming already. You've been bringing bulls and goats already. Now I'm asking you to bring your heart with you and come to me. And I will respond. God always promises to respond to faithful, heartfelt, genuine, sincere repentance and worship. Always. Always. Romans 10, when Paul's giving the way we're saved, if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. God says, come to me now. Come to me. But like every invitation, every invitation, there's always a choice to be made. There can be the choice to gloriously accept and receive, but we all know there can also be a choice to reject. God acknowledges that in verse 19 and 20. Look what he says, verse 19. The consequences. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Oh, man, I'm telling you. If you're willing, if you'll come with your heart and be my people from the heart, the good of the land is laid before you. Everything, everything I have of a promised land, everything I have of goodness is before you, and it'll be yours. Put your feet under my table and dine. It's mine. And if you'll come with your heart, with your heart, oh, it's going to be glorious. Verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now listen, we need not act as though Jesus did not give consequential instruction to his disciples and to us. He did. He said, if you love me, obey me. He said, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But if we fail to do so and walk after the world of flesh and the devil, Hebrews says that God, like a father, is a father who will discipline us. He will take us to the woodshed and he will discipline us. Yes, we have choices. But listen, choices always have consequences. If you're below 50, I hope you'll learn that because it don't seem like we have yet. Choices always have consequences. Your choices have consequences. If somebody other than you is making choices and their choices affect you, your choice is how you'll respond to that and how God will deal with your consequence. He says, come now, let us reason together. Accepting Christ has the wonderful and blessed consequence. Menninger, the great psychiatrist, said two things. He said, if I could get people to know that they are forgiven of their sin, he said, he used the figure 75%. He said, I would empty 75% of the beds in mental institutions. People are driven insane. They're driven to mental illness because of their guilt and shame and condemnation. When God says, I want to make you clean. I want to forgive your sin. I want to separate your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. I'll never meet again. I want to put them in the seal of forgetfulness and remember them no more. And I want you, not that you don't remember them, but that you remember I've forgiven you and I've cleansed you of them. He said, I think uh, most of the rest of the beds I could empty if I could get those who are unforgiving and unwilling to forgive, to forgive from the heart like they're commanded to do. Condemnation and unforgiveness has been identified for decades, if not centuries, 
has the greatest issues of mental health struggles and troubles and problems. Psychiatrists can't cleanse you from that. The doctor can't get you over that. He can talk about all the symptoms. He can treat all the issues. But only God can cleanse. He wants to be to you a father. He wants to be to you a Lord and a master. He wants to be to you a leader. He wants to be to you a doctor. He wants to be to you a protector. And all of those things He will be when from the heart we receive Him and enter into that covenant. But then when we from the heart walk with Him in that covenant. You see how a chapter like this can worry your pastor. You see, I could be the chief among this chapter. I could be the first and the worst of it all. I don't believe God will ever say, I was impressed with that sermon you preached. I don't believe he'll ever say that. I believe what he'll say to me is, I saw you, my son. I saw you. I saw you fall. I saw you fall. It was hard. It was bad. But I heard you weep. And I saw you cry out before me and ask me to forgive me and to cleanse you. And on the precious promise of the blood of my son, you came and you found. And I gladly gave cleansing, forgiveness, renewal. I could be the chief of the religious formalist. And I could lead you to be that. I could create an environment that would make you comfortable in that. And the deceiver could make us think together that's okay. But I'd answer to God for that one day. I'd answer to God for that. But for God to see us, see our heart, to see our motives, to see our intents, to know why we sang, to know why we praised, to know why we worshiped, to know why we chose righteousness when the world, flesh, and the devil presented unrighteousness, to know what motivated us was the blood of His Son and the blood of His covenant with us, the gratitude for the pit He's lifted us out of to never crawl back into it again. for the respect for and the gratitude to the precious Holy Spirit who lives in us to lead us and to guide us and to be all of those five things in us and to us out of gratitude and love and reverence and respect from the heart, from the heart. I've heard it all, as you can imagine. Children have come forward because mama looked down and said, you're 10 or you're 12, it's time for you to join the church. And they came down now, got baptized. Everybody cried over them, pat them on the back, and said, wonderful, they started thinking, well, mama said, come, I came. Some came because two or three of their friends came. It was the popular thing to do, so they followed them right on down and came in and got in line, and they went through things. None of it was ever from the heart. Jesus spoke about people like this, did he not, to his disciples? He talked about those people. He said, in that day, they're going to say to me, Lord, 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 Lord. It was a word they used, but it wasn't a the life they lived. Lord, Lord, we did, we did that. We cast out demons. Lord, we, we, we did all kind of good stuff. She said, I'm going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Doesn't that sound exactly like Malachi to you? God's not changed. We're covenant people by the blood of the innocent dying for the guilty. In our case, it's the blood of the Savior who ended all of the blood of bulls and goats. But added to that blood covenant in Christ Jesus is an indwelling Holy Spirit that comes and brings us from death to life that baptism is a picture of, that indwells us and leads us in the life of God, not only teaches us, but enables us, empowers us to walk in it and to live in it from the heart. And he says things like that. To worship me from the heart. To forgive one another from the heart. 
to serve one another from the heart, to share the gospel of the lost world from a heart that's redeemed and knows him. God says, live with me from the heart. Because listen, what does God see? He sees it all. When we open the Bible, one of the attributes of the Bible is that of God is God's word. The writer of Hebrews says, we're naked and open before him with whom we have to do. God sees the heart. This morning, maybe you're here and from the heart, you've never responded to Christ. You've never accepted him. Maybe it was you're trying to appease a mom or daddy. You're, you're trying to appease a husband. You're trying to appease a wife. And you went through some motions because you're trying to appease them and get them off your case. But it was never from the heart. Listen. That is a deception that Satan longs to use to pull you down eternally to a place called hell. But the Spirit of God wants to convict you to see the difference and say to you, come to me from the heart today. Come to me from the heart today. Bring me your heart today. And I will cleanse and I will forgive and I will save you. Maybe today you say, Pastor, I've done that from the heart. He saved me. Maybe you find yourself this morning one of those, though, that's just going through the outward. Matter of fact, I excuse the inward conviction by saying, oh, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. And you, the devil has used that as an excuse to keep living an outward life that's not true to the inward heart. It's not been out of love. It's not been out of motivation of righteousness and godliness. God says today, listen, he said to Israel, you've gone backward. You've gone backward. That's why we call it backsliding. Because listen, come back. Come back to me. Come, come back to an altar of a holy God who loves you and he'll forgive you. Come to an altar and from the heart cry out and watch what God will do. See what God will do as he welcomes you back and as he renews and restores. Maybe God's leading you to come and place your life in covenant membership. To be a covenant people of God together with others that we might strive to be biblical, spiritual, and practical from the heart. From the heart. Whatever decision is today, whatever it is that God's saying to you by the Spirit of the living God, He sees our heart. Let's pray. Father, today I pray that truly from the heart our response will come to You. God will not believe the lies and the deceptions of the enemies. God will not believe the excuses. But God, we will hear the divine invitation come and Lord will come whatever the need is for that one that needs to be saved today I pray that from the heart they'll come and be gloriously saved for that child of yours that covenant child of yours that's gone backward that today from the heart will come and will return God do for us what we can't do for ourselves we open our life to you to be our Father, our Lord, our leader, our doctor, our protector. All in and through the redeeming work of our Savior in Jesus' name. Would you stand? Our deacons are here to pray with you if you'd like. You don't have to pray with them. You can come and kneel and pray. You can pray there where you are. But this morning, would you respond to that invitation? Come now. Come now. If it's you that needs to come, God says, come now. Do it now. You come. As we pray for you, as we pray with you, you come from the heart. You come.